Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Affordable Learning Georgia uh, RFP review or the online interest meeting for our Affordable Materials grants. Uh, I'm Jeff Gallant. I'm the Program Director of Affordable Learning Georgia. Uh, Tiffany Reardon is the Program Manager. Normally she would be with us, but today she is out sick. Uh, so I will be uh, just answering questions here on my own. But uh, later on, if you send me any questions that have to do with really in-depth uh, instructional design, accessibility, using Manifold, uh, anything about uh, your pedagogy, Tiffany is an amazing contact for that. So I'll be sending, uh, sending that question her way. In fact, if you have a question for us, it doesn't hurt to include us both in the email. Uh, I'm at jeff.gallant at usg.edu, and Tiffany is at tiffany.reardon uh, at usg.edu, although that just changed. It is tiffany.tarena at usg.edu. Let me put that in the chat. Uh, so I'm going to... There we go. Uh, Tiffany just got married, so uh, very much congratulations to her. And her old email address does direct to the new one, but it's always better to just have the updated one. So in chat, if you could please share your institution or your department, uh, whether or not it's your first time with ALG or you're a returning person, uh, and why affordable and open resources are important to you. I'm not going to spend a lot of time just waiting for people to type this in chat, but uh, it, it always helps for everyone to see where everyone else is coming from. Uh, so if you are so inclined, please type that out in chat and let us know um, uh, where you're from and, and uh, what you'd like to do here. Um, so I'm going to continue in the interest of time, but please share these out. So affordable materials grants are very specific things. They are funding from the USG to an institution for a team of faculty and professional staff to get some great work done uh, to transform your courses using, uh, using uh, OER and other affordable materials or if you've already done that, or um, if you're just looking for a smaller project for individuals or teams to improve OER that's already out there, including things like uh, creating ancillary materials too. So it's not just revising existing OER that, uh, you know, that you have a link to or something like that. It's also building on that as well. So let's talk first about transformation grants. They're kind of our oldest one, the uh, first go rounds and our round one of grants all the way back in 2014. We had these, but we called them textbook transformation grants. Uh, these projects are, they are per team member up to $30,000. The maximum award you can have for an individual team member for their salary, their course release, their travel for their for their time and their supplies um, is five thousand dollars. That doesn't mean you have to say each team member is getting five thousand dollars, and we can only have sixteen members. Um, you can say that each one is getting four thousand, and we have more team members. Uh, you can go all the way down to just being a five thousand dollar project with one team member. That is very new. That is something that we've decided is that we can scale these from one person transforming their course all the way up to entire departments. And so as an individual, you can now apply for a transformation grant. It used to be that there was a minimum of two people in each transformation grant team because we wanted that collaboration and we still do, but it doesn't always work out for everyone the same way. So we wanna make this as flexible and scalable as possible. But that 30,000 is the maximum total award per grant. So that includes um, not just what your team members are paid, but any additional project expenses, uh, such as uh, software platforms or uh, particular hardware that you might need. There were uh, a few teams using things like a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino. That's really cool stuff that goes under additional project expenses. Uh, they do need to be justified in the proposal, of course. 
If you have other project costs, yeah, you can build them into the grants. Just be sure to be very clear to reviewers in both the budget section and the rest of your proposal while you need those. If you have a proposal and it sounds really cool, and then all of a sudden there's an expense at the end for some software platform that nobody's ever heard of, it's not in the proposal itself and nobody knows how, why you're going to use it, that's going to set off a million red flags to the reviewers. So be very clear if you have an expense, what it's going to be used for. Now, continuous improvement grants are what we used to call our mini grants. Basically, these are for sustainability purposes, for improving OER that already exists, uh, to make it more possible for these materials to be updated by you and uh, continue on in teaching with affordable materials as a result. Uh, so these are 2000 maximum per team member, um, 10,000 maximum for the total award. And again, you can build other project expenses into this budget. Uh, because they are about revision and adaptation, we want to make sure that we define what that is. Um, a major adaptation of a resource or a substantial improvement wouldn't be something like uh, we added three sentences onto an open textbook about the year 2021. It would be a big revision that has to do with making sure that, let's say you you're, you've you been using an OER, but uh, there have been substantial errors in there that you need to fix. Uh, it's not as accessible as it should be. Um, it's not quite geared toward your students the way that it should be. All of that goes into a really cool continuous improvement grant uh, project. Uh, ancillary materials, those are any materials that you could create to support the instruction of a course using all of that existing OER that's out there. Um, so maybe you've got an open textbook and there's just nothing on the side for it. And that's an, that is a frequent complaint when it comes to finding an open educational resource that is just standing out there on its own. It doesn't have things like lecture slides. It doesn't have a practice quiz bank. It doesn't have videos on the side for uh, students to watch. All of that uh, qualifies as ancillary materials and a continuous improvement grant. Stuff that makes your teaching with OER uh, easier for you to do or even in an improved way when it comes to online uh, resources. Now there are priority categories within the application process. So this kind of subdivides things a little bit, but it really, it's not the same as saying that you need to meet one of these categories. Um, this isn't like one of those grants where they tell you that it's an optional thing but really it's a mandatory thing. I've seen those grants before. I've seen these competitions before. That's not the case with an ALG grant. You really want to have a great plan and a great proposal first and foremost. If you meet these priority categories and there are just so many great proposals that we can't award all of them, then we will definitely look at these and the small amount of extra points um, as a deciding factor. But most of the time, the deciding factor is going to be the quality of your proposal. So these exist, they help, but if, it, if your project does not meet these categories, you are not disqualified from applying. It is just that you don't meet these particular priority categories. Uh, so the first one is collaborative projects with professional support. We have found over the years that the more um, professional support staff you bring onto your team, the better the project turns out. Uh, whether or not you get an instructional designer and that person functions as a project manager, or you get a librarian and they help you find all of the OER you need, and if they can't, then they'll get you library resources that you can uh, use at no additional cost to students too. Um, you could bring on uh, UNG Press or other OER publishers that help you transform your informal materials into a textbook. Uh, there's instructional technologists out there that might help with the tech behind the scenes. Web designers, if you really want um, your own particular web app or something like that. Uh, programmers, same thing. Graphic designers uh, are 
especially needed when it comes to making new resources with visual elements. All of these count uh, towards a collaborative project. I think uh, when instructors are not structurally an island in these teams, um, things work out a little bit better every time. So that's why we have this category. Uh, the next one involves student participation in the creation, the adaptation, or the like massive evaluation of materials. So this is an opportunity to get students involved in the creation process, increasing their agency in the classroom, uh, looking at ways for not only the instructor to be the point of all generated knowledge in the classroom, but also for students to be uh, producing resources for each other. This is uh, what we often think of as open pedagogy, uh, and it's kind of in the classical sense of open pedagogy, of uh, giving students more control in um, teaching each other how to do particular things. Uh, so grants in this category include students as active participants. Now, if you have a student that takes a survey at the end of the course that says uh, whether or not they liked the textbook, that's OK for uh, quantitative analysis. That's not a student as an active participant. But let's say that they are curating content um, for a new course or they're uh, they're helping out by writing their own perspectives and they're sharing them out with the world like that kind of stuff is amazing and so that's what we're talking about with active student participation here uh, departmental scaling projects so affordable learning georgia has always supported uh, those core innovative uh, instructors and professional staff that say we want to get this project off the ground as soon as possible. Here's our team. We're the interested ones. Let's do it. And often the uh, use of those affordable materials will stay within that small group and not really expand because there's just not enough support uh, for an entire department to really get on board. Uh, this category prioritizes getting the department uh, on board and this is only if the department is already committed to this. So if your department wants to boost the use of uh, OER from uh, one very successful small team, or maybe even just one instructor to full out everyone's teaching it throughout the uh, entire department, then departmental scaling projects are for you. Uh, that should be in the letter of support that there is a commitment for the department to at least pilot the project in all sections. Um, if you have a proposal that says if the department um, implements this or decides to, uh, then it will affect this many students and uh, save students this much. That doesn't work as a departmental scaling project. There should already be a commitment before this starts that the department will try this out uh, at least for one semester. Um, most of the departmental scaling projects result in entire departments using them. That's really cool. Uh, every so often we'll see a project where uh, the department hadn't bought in from the beginning and you know we are not forcing anyone to uh, do this, so they just decided not to. So we want to make sure that we're we're funding departments on the basis of a departmental scaling project uh, that are already committed to do so. I'm going to quickly check out the chat here. Oh, we've got people introducing themselves. OK, awesome. Good to see you all. Very cool. All right, I'm going to keep moving. If you have any questions as you come across these, uh, type them right in the chat and I will jump to the chat at various points. Um, the last one is upper level campus collaborations. So the thing about open educational resources is that often the funding from nonprofit organizations, the really big funding that went to places like OpenStax, uh, went to cover courses that have the most amount of students and also courses that have a very high average uh, textbook cost for required materials. And because of that, there aren't as many upper level graduate or um, you know, graduate including doctoral courses uh, that have relevant and in-depth open educational resources. Um, 
there are often no cost resources out there, at least no cost to your students in the form of library resources, uh, also open access journal articles, things like that. But it's it's very common for someone in a 4000 level course to search for OER and find absolutely nothing. So the tough thing about it when it comes to Affordable Learning Georgia is that these courses are often small. Uh, they may not have that many students taking them even throughout the entire institution if a department took on the whole thing. So we are encouraging campuses to collaborate with each other on this. Um, if you have a course that doesn't necessarily have a lot of students, but it's very critical to uh, a major or something like that, it's important that uh, the costs are reduced, but it's one of those things where we need to make sure that there's a big enough team. So that's why grants in this category involve collaboration between institutions for upper level courses. Now again, these are priorities. These are not requirements. If you have an upper, upper level course that you are addressing at your institution, you can apply for a project. That is not a problem. This priority is for uh, upper level courses where campuses are working together. It's a way for us to prioritize and say we would love to see these kinds of projects happen. But it is not grounds for disqualification if you are not collaborating with another campus. You just wouldn't be in this priority category. So this is kind of the the tougher part of all of it. It is the, the weird sticking point that there are categories which are just our transformation grants and our continuous improvement grants. But then there are the priority categories. These are optional. They are not requirements. And these are the ones that they are They're just just those four. So now we'll talk a little bit about how funding works because that is extremely important. Uh, funding is not one of those things where we are sending a direct stipend to team members. Uh, it goes to the institution and this covers the team members time, the expenses, the departmental needs, the stuff on your budget in the proposal and the statement of work so long as it meets their policies. Um, so a lot of this will sometimes depend on the institution and because of that we want to make sure that you reach out to whoever is your contact for funding your business office your grants office someone in your own department if you have a really big department with uh, their own administrators uh, making sure that what you want to do and the budget that you have actually work within their policies um, this funding process is through what we call a service level agreement. It is a contract between us and the institution acknowledging that we are all part of the same system. Uh, we are sending funding this way for this project to happen and 50% uh, of it will be awarded at the beginning once everybody signs it and says yes, this is OK uh, in order to get the project started. The other 50% is awarded at the end when the final report is submitted. So the institutions are responsible for disbursement. That includes your salary, your travel reimbursement, um, any of the purchases of uh, supplies, equipment, that type of thing. Uh, these budgets, of course, are supported by state funds. So institutions have to comply with state and Board of Regents policies, but usually those are built right in to the institutional policies and procedures. Uh, so because of that, the questions about is this OK? Is this not OK? That really goes to your institution. If you send it to me, most of the time we say that's up to your institution. Here's a couple of ways that institutions tend to do this, and then you'll just have to talk to the institutional people. Um, it doesn't uh, include the federal grants, the external grant guidelines. Uh, you may be pointed to that. Uh, there are BOR policies for grants when it comes to, let's say, the and uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities or the NSA. Um, that's different from our agreements. So those guidelines, uh, some of them will apply, but not all. Your institution might vary on this, though. You might have a grants office that says, no matter what the grant, no matter what the kind of external funding, we ca uh, we categorize any external funding being something that's just not from our institution. And if that's the institution's policies, then that's how it goes. Um, so 
again, it's really important to contact the people who are in charge of things like grant funding at your institution before you apply. Now, these grants do not include indirect expenses. They are only direct expenses, and there's often some confusion about this. What we're saying here is that the indirect expenses that usually fund an institution to keep the lights on because an external organization is funding them to do a project, those do not count. We are all part of the same system. It's a little different than that. So if uh, on the project someone has added something like uh, the abbreviation FNA, which is uh, facilities and administration, uh, those are not things that are covered in uh, any of our grants uh, because what they what indirect expenses are doing are saying like, OK, you're an external funder. You're not part of our organization, but we are allowing this project to happen. So here's what here's the uh, the office staff, the uh, electrical bills, the maintenance fees, all of that stuff uh, for the lab for that project to happen. That doesn't happen with these projects. Direct expenses funds the project directly. That includes your time. So if in the project you're covering a course release or overload pay or something like that, if it's salary, then the fringes that go with that salary are part of the direct expenses. So you might see um, your grants office saying, OK, well, here are the expenses. Here's what's actually paid. Here's healthcare. Here's taxes. Those are not indirect expenses. Those are attached to the time that it takes to get this project done. Uh, so long as your salary is funded, those are funded too. So that is part of the direct expenses. We often get questions about the difference between fringes and indirect expenses. Indirect expenses are about funding the institution to get something done that is different from anything that has to do with funding you and your time. Uh, project supplies are also, of course, direct expenses. Software, of course, direct expenses. So here's a quick timeline. Uh, round 20, uh, the applications are due November 1st at midnight. Um, then after that, we'll do some reviews. Notifications will be sent out Monday, November 22nd. Uh, and then the online kickoff, which is half of the kickoff. It is the synchronous part where we meet online is Friday, December 10th. Round 21 uh, starts February 14th. That's the deadline for it. You can apply for either of these rounds today if you felt like it, which is very different for us. We have uh, put in a system where you can apply for either of them depending on your timeline, depending on how it works for you. Um, then there's some reviews that go on. Notifications March 7th and then the online kickoff March 25th. So for transformation grants, at least one team member needs to participate in that required online synchronous kickoff meeting on that Friday. Uh, all of the members are required to participate in the asynchronous training. Uh, once you're uh, once you're awarded, we will reach out with all the information you need to complete that asynchronous training. Um, it is a lot of uh, the stuff that we want to teach, kind of the fundamentals, what open educational resources are, how copyright works. It's great to do all of that in uh, one synchronous setting where we all get to know each other. It's not that easy this year when uh, travel is few and far between. So uh, we are doing the online part where we all get to know each other and our projects. We talk a bit about the procedures because we all need to be there and understand how that works. But the asynchronous stuff, which is extremely important, is still required for all members. Uh, continuous improvement grants, asynchronous training is required. Kickoff meeting is not required, but uh, recommended. You can still go for sure. So we're about to run through the application process, but before that happens, I'm going to jump to the chat and see if there are any questions about what we just went through. Uh, I'll give you a couple of minutes here to type things in too.
And we got a question from Ashley Davis. If we are interested in applying for two courses, do the courses have to be consecutive? Uh, no. Your team can address uh, more than one course within a department. They can even go uh, into multiple departments if it's a coherent uh, plan, a coherent strategy. So that's that's totally fine if you have two non consecutive courses. Thank you. Uh, yep, uh, Sherry Sertikoff says, can you indicate which semesters are covered by each round? Uh, so each of these are a year long in terms of the semester. So round 20 uh, starts in fall of 2021. That means that it goes all the way to fall of 2022. Transformation grant projects last that long. Um, continuous improvement grant projects can pick to end a semester before that, so they could end in summer 22, uh, 2022 if you feel like it, or they could end in fall 2022 as well. Um, once you get to round 21, that starts in spring 2022, so it would go until spring 2023 with continuous improvement grants having the option to end in fall 2022 if they would like to. Thank you. All right, so we, oh, Zach Johnson says, what if we want to move away from a textbook and we have the notes and text in D12 Brightspace? Is that something we could do? So if you have, uh, your own notes that you have created or an open textbook that you have created and you've hosted it in the learning management system. Um, by the end of the project, we're going to need to make sure that those resources that you've created uh, through the grant are shared openly with everybody under an open license. Uh, Creative Commons attribution license is the default. Uh, if there are some things you're repurposing with a more restrictive Creative Commons license, like share alike, uh, like non-commercial, we can totally add those and that's fine. Um, now, you can't just have it in D2L at the end because D2L is a closed system. It even disappears for the students who aren't taking that course uh, at Georgia Highlands. So you will need an alternative way of sharing them if it's only in D2L. Now, if you've got a commercial textbook digitized in D2L, then you have to look at the rights for that. Chances are it's not going to fly um, if you just have a digitized commercial resource. Um, when it comes to the reviewers reading an application and saying, oh, they're going to just copy the textbook uh, wholesale from a commercial source, that's not going to fly for them either. They'll often probably ask what what the uh, what the time is going towards. So basically, these projects end in shared open resources. If you've created anything, uh, they are definitely about transforming the course. Um, you do still need to uh, work within uh, just you know legal guidelines, uh, copyright, that type of thing. Now, if you have a textbook that is shared uh, using library resources where everybody at your institution has access to it, but uh, nobody else does, that is OK if you're pivoting to using library resources. That's a little different because those resources were already paid for. Students do not have to pay anything additional for them. But if you're creating anything to use with that, uh, maybe lecture notes, uh, maybe uh, a shared practice quiz bank, something like that, then you'd want to share out those resources at the end for sure. Does that make sense, uh, Zach? Does that? Yeah, I hope so. OK, cool. And of course, if you have any more questions about uh, your specific instance there, send them right over to 
uh, these these things can get somewhat complicated, especially if you're looking at some cool documents and the provenance is kind of unknown. It's like, well, where where did this all come from again? We're not sure. Uh, that's it can get hairy, but we'll work through it. OK, I am going to continue on. So here is all about how to apply. First of all, the website is affordablelearninggeorgia.org. That is a pretty long name for a website, and the URLs get a little bit long from there too. But if you just go to the main grants page and you bookmark the request for proposals page from there, uh, you know, something like this, if I were to just click the star on it, should be fine. Uh, if you just go to the Affordable Materials Grants big giant button, and you click on that, you'll find the round that you're looking for, either fall 2021 to 2022 or spring 2022 to 2023. Then you can just bookmark this page. This has everything that you're going to need, including some descriptions of what everything is, and then the application process itself. Here's the request for proposals documents, the rubrics that are used by reviewers, the Word application forms, the Grants and Business Office acknowledgement forms, we'll go through all of these, and then the online application link. So let's first take a, a look at what these Word documents are. And I've blown this up to 200%, so hopefully these are readable. So this is um, the Continuous Improvement Grants application form. I'm going here first because it's a little bit smaller. Uh, it talks about uh, the way to submit the official proposal. You got to do it through the RFP page. You can't just email this in. Um, the kickoff meeting, we have blocked off 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. for the synchronous part. Now you're going to want to put in all of your information here. Uh, this is what the peer reviewers are looking at first. Um, they are not going to be looking at the online application form um, because that form just doesn't really translate too well to a printable view. Uh, and so we don't ask for everything over there the way that we ask for everything on this form. Uh, so the applicant is the project lead. Uh, most of the time that's going to be you. Oh, I see that there is a chat question. I see the Chrome browser, not the Word doc. Do all of you see the uh, Word document right now uh, that I'm scrolling through? It says applicant and team information right now. Can you just type in chat whether or not you see that? OK. Oh, good. I think it, it probably just got stuck, uh, Rachel. It might The video may have gotten stuck for you. Uh, it, if it continues to be stuck, um, if you're not seeing a Word document that's scrolling, uh, you may need to uh, restart Teams and just see how that goes. It seems like maybe the video froze. So yeah, uh, the project lead is probably you if you're in this meeting. Um, the submitter is whoever is submitting the application. Often the applicant and the submitter are going to be the same person, but not all the time. Um, the submitter can sometimes be a grants officer. They can sometimes be your department's administrator. Um, so for example, if you're at Georgia Gwinnett College and you have an application to send in uh, and the grants office wants to help out with that and help you submit your application, they can put their name and email and position on the submitter part of it. If you're the one who's submitting it, just leave the submitter stuff blank. We already have your information. Oh, OK, you see it now. Awesome. There are uh, spaces here for other team members. Um, so team member one, two, three, four and five. If you have more team members, just put them right in here. And then um, you're going to want to replace all of this italic text and we put something at the beginning about that. Now, this is just for guidance. Uh, you're going to want to put the one that applies for you. So your type of project here, uh, because this is a continuous improvement grant, we're just looking for uh, kind of a broad definition of what you're going to do. Are you going to create some ancillaries? You're going to revise some existing OER, going to replace current OER courses with better stuff. Uh, all of that can be uh, part of it. The requested amount of funding. So this is the total amount. The course titles and the course numbers for what you're doing. 
the final semester of the project. So because it's a continuous improvement, you can pick summer or fall. Um, any existing resources that are going to be revised. This really helps out with uh, people who want to check out the old stuff. Then uh, here's the more narrative section. Here's the project goals. Uh, what are the materials you're going to create or revise? Uh, what are you aiming for here? Uh, the action plan. So this is the task that you'll need to, uh, to complete the project. And be sure to be detailed on this. Estimate the amount of time it's going to take for these major tasks to get done. This really helps out um, for you so that you know how much how much time you're going to dedicate to this project and it helps for reviewers because they'll look at the budget, see the time that it's covering and they'll be able to tell whether or not it's realistic. For example, if you're saying you're going to write a series of three textbooks in uh, two semesters and it's just yourself and you have a $2,000 budget that's going to cover about five hours of time and that's all hypothetical, but that wouldn't be a realistic project, of course. So we really want to know where this time is going. Then the timeline, this includes your major milestones and your deadlines. Um, and of course, you want to keep in mind your final semester where the final report gets submitted. The budget is where all of the uh, money is going to. You can be as detailed as you want in here, and some grants offices will help you out with these details but you don't have to be. Um, if your uh, grants office just wants to say, for now, just say, okay, so here's 2,000 towards this person, 2,000 towards that person. We'll figure out the fringes on the back end. That's okay. Um, we do not uh, require you to have an unbelievable amount of detail here in the budget section. We know that your institution and you will work that out. Of course, there is an acknowledgement that uh, any new materials or revisions are going to be made available to the public under a, an, an attribution Creative Commons license, uh, with exceptions for modification of pre existing resources that have more restrictive licenses to them. Uh, the accessibility terms. So, you do understand that any new materials or revisions uh, are developed in compliance with specific accessibility standards uh, that are defined in the request for proposals. So again, be sure to read the RFP. Uh, the letter of support. Uh, so this is the uh, letter that comes from uh, a higher up administrator, such as a department chair. If you are the department chair, maybe it's the dean, depending on the structure of your institution. Uh, it could be the provost, the VPAA, uh, somebody who is above you saying, we support this. Uh, that's so, when we start getting the ball rolling, we don't just suddenly get somebody saying, nobody told me about this. This isn't possible. We can't do it. Um, so that this is just to make sure that the institution is fine with this taking place. If you have multi-institutional things, even in a continuous improvement grant, we need both institutions to provide a letter of support. If your institution is contracting out to somebody, uh, so they, as the institution, are paying an external person, like an external web designer or programmer. They don't need a letter of support from that web designer's company. Um, the institution is still funding that. Uh, so that's not going to be a problem. But let's say it is a joint project between University of North Georgia and Georgia Highlands College. We need two letters of support in that case. We also have an acknowledgement form from the Grants or Business Office, and we'll get to that in over here. So this used to be another letter from the Grants or Business Office. We wanted uh, you know, some sort of acknowledgement that you contacted the people who are in charge of funding, and you talked to them about what you want to apply for. They know you're applying for it. Um, that way, this is another nobody told us avoidance, uh, just in case because we really do not want to surprise, uh, you know, especially the smaller institutions, business offices with uh, you know, seven new projects that they did not know about until they got started. Uh, so this helps you get to know the people you're going to be working alongside. Uh, if they have some stuff to share with you, um, I know some institutions do kind of a mandatory meeting to make sure that you know 
how that stuff operates, um, then they will sign this form. So this is no longer a letter that they have to write themselves. This is just uh, the applicant name, the representative from the Grants and Business Office name, and the signature. Now there are um, a couple of exceptions to this. So let's say that you have a main financial contact in your department. Uh, I've seen this happen at bigger places like UGA, Georgia State, Georgia Tech. That can totally work too. It's whoever is going to be your contact for funding for the rest of this. OK, so let's look at the other application, the transformation grant application. So this is for the full course transformations, right? So we're going to need some extra details that continuous improvement grants don't necessarily require. Um, so we've got the applicant and team information just like last time, got the team members listed just like last time. The priority category goes right here. Requested total amount of funding is going to be a little higher, most likely. The final semester of the project. So for this, it's always going to be one thing because all transformation grants end at the maximum end of the project. So fall 2022 for round 20, uh, spring 2023 for round 21. Using an OpenStax textbook, this just lets us know whether or not we can get OpenStax to contact you and help you out with uh, instructor resources. This just uh, speeds up their process a little bit so that they know your faculty um, and they can help out. So now we've got impact data here. This stuff is not in the continuous improvement grants because that's all about improving OER. This is about transforming a course, so we need to know um, your estimates for how many students this is going to affect uh, per semester and per year. And we need to know um, how much money is going to save each student. So we talk about the course title and number and course instructors, the average number of students enrolled per section, um, the average number of affected course sections in a summer, fall or spring semester. The total number of course sections scheduled in an academic year that will be affected. The total number of student section enrollments per academic year. So this is how many students will be affected per academic year. The original required commercial materials. The uh, original cost per student section enrollment. So the cost of all materials per student in row seven. If you have two courses, you are not adding these up to say that the original cost per student is both of these courses required materials. It is just one. The average post project uh, cost per student section enrollment. So let's say that you are using a low cost homework platform along with these open educational resources. Your cost of that uh, of that platform would go right here. Then the average post project savings per student section enrollment, which is kind of one of the pivotal numbers, is the original cost minus the post project cost which gets you the student savings. Then per academic year, you're multiplying this number, which is the savings number, by the total number of enrollments affected per academic year. So we get an annual student savings number um, for this one course. Then you can do it for course number two. Uh, this is because in the past we used to do it just like assemble all of your courses together, get an average cost of all of the course materials um, and then per student. So then uh, it's just per student per enrollment. It got really hairy once you wound up with six different courses. So being able to put in the data for each course makes this a lot more transparent. And so we don't have to go back and say, well, OK, the average is this, even though it says it's $800 per student because there are six courses. That's not what we're looking at. So yeah, this is just a lot of space to give you uh, more than one course here. And if you have more courses to add, you can copy the table as many times as you want to complete all the courses. Uh, note that this should not be per instructor per course. Uh, you're not gonna do uh, six courses with 18 faculty instructors and then have 18 entries because the faculty all teach one section of the course. You want one course in each table, do an average past that point. 
So then we get to the narrative section. This is what peer reviewers are especially going to be looking at. Uh, what are your project goals? Um, this is very important. Uh, it goes beyond just cost savings. The goals are not about uh, you saying, we want to do this project. We want to um, replace this textbook with this other thing. Uh, the goals should be things like student success, uh, like looking at uh, course level student retention, um, that type of stuff. Uh, pedagogical transformation. Maybe you want uh, to move your teaching in a different direction, and here's how you're going to do it. That's your project goals. Um, the statement of transformation is all about why it's important for you, for your department, for your institution. Uh, so for example, why do cost savings matter so much uh, for a particular course at your institution? Um, what do the drop fail withdraw rates look like? What are you looking to uh, hopefully improve on something like that or grade performance? Um, then an overall description of what the project's going to do, therefore affecting this description. If you have references to uh, scholarly literature about this, anything to support the claims of your impact, this is where that stuff would go. The action plan is all about how it gets done. So we've got the why up here. This is the how. Um, so you're going to make sure that each team member has their roles defined. I mean, you could say that there are six faculty instructors, but one of them has to be the project lead, right? Uh, maybe somebody is going to be an editor. Uh, maybe you've got two instructional designers on the staff. Well, that's great, but what are they going to do? Uh, so making sure that not only their roles are defined, but also estimating how long uh, the major tasks that these team members will complete will take. Uh, again, it's just like what we were talking about with continuous improvement. The reviewers need to see that the budget and the time you've set aside meet the task that you're going to do. Um, you want a review of the existing stuff for the courses. Uh, we often will get an application that says we are going to use OER in this course and then not really say, um, you know, that they've looked it over and they found a few different options. Instead, they want to leave that review for later. If if we're looking at a project where we're just kind of going, well, this might work or this might not, OK, fine. But your project's going to stand out if you've already gotten this review done so that you know that maybe you've got some options. Or you can say, we looked around and we haven't found any options at all. Therefore, we are going to create X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, this is kind of the rationale for the project taking place, this review. So this really helps you stand out. Uh, then, of course, the plan for the adoption of those materials includes some plans for open licensing, making your materials accessible, uh, the plan for redesigning your courses. So if you have any time that's going to be devoted to instructional design work, uh, aligning OER to a curriculum, um, making sure that uh, everything is accessible, that goes in here. And uh, a bit about the plan for providing open access to the materials. We will host them in our repository. If you're going to host them elsewhere, that's also great. We just want to know where you're going to be. Um, then quantitative and qualitative measures. Another thing that is not required in continuous improvement grants, but is required in transformation. Um, there are going to be uh, some measures that you'll want to uh, look at, including student satisfaction, student performance, and course level retention. You'll do this in varied ways. Some people will do surveys. Some people might do interviews. Uh, some people might really dive deep into the data. Uh, it really depends on your team. These applications uh, will stand out if you go beyond the minimum of we have an end of semester uh, student satisfaction survey and we'll just pick it up from there. Uh, so yeah, uh, look at the quantitative and qualitative measures you're going to do and describe what it is you're looking for. Now, of course, if you are doing any kind of research, you may need to get in contact with your IRB. Uh, please be sure that you've indicated whether or not you need IRB approval uh, because you might have some work ahead of you in just getting that stuff approved. The timeline, just like with continuous improvement grants, get the major milestones, the events, the deadlines should result in the final report. If it goes beyond that into sustainability work, that's really cool. 
but be sure to include the submission of your final report in this list. Um, because often uh, teams will say, yeah, and then we'll submit the final report in summer 2023. And we say you can't do that because the project has to end at this particular semester. That's when the funding is released. If it goes over that point, it would have to be in a different round. Um, then for the budget, this is how the funding is going to work. 5,000 maximum per team member, uh, 30,000 maximum total award, just like we were talking about. I see a chat message. It says, is the maximum 10,000 or 30,000? The maximum for a transformation grant is 30,000. Uh, the maximum for a continuous improvement grant is 10,000. Uh, they're just different levels of funding there. Oh, thank you. Um, Julianne, I see that your hand is raised. I think you were raising it to say that you saw the Word document earlier, uh, but if you do have a question, just type it right on it. Um, there is a sustainability plan to each, uh, to each transformation grants project, and that's because we want to make sure that uh, these projects are set up to last, uh, that the savings don't just stop at one semester. That, these, that the impact of these projects goes on for a while. So once all of it's done, what happens? Uh, who updates the course materials? Um, you know, who commits to using affordable materials past that point? Um, are there possible expansions later on? Are you gonna share this work uh, through maybe your professional conferences, something like that? If you're planning on that, that's really cool. We'd love to hear about it. Uh, same thing with Creative Commons terms, same thing for accessibility terms, same thing for the letter of support. Um, then the uh, Grants or Business uh, Acknowledgement Form 2, and that's it. So these are all very similar to the continuous part. Be sure that you're using the right application. If you are a transformation project and you go into the continuous improvement grants, it's going to be very confusing once we start reading that. Oh, yep, so you were correct. OK, cool. So let's jump right back in here to this. So this might look a little bit small at the moment. That's OK. The rubrics are available on the RFP pages. Uh, there are three reviewers per transformation grants. There is one reviewer per continuous improvement grants, and then there is administrative review past that point. Uh, but the peer reviewers are using this uh, scoring system here. Uh, there is different weight depending on what it is. So clarity and alignment, you know, you, you spell things right, you dot your T's. Uh, that, yeah, you dot your T's, you cross your I's. You know what I mean. Um, that stuff uh, gets weighted times one. Student savings impact gets weighted times three. Organization and planning and feasibility also weighted times three. There's also teaching and learning impact and qualitative and qualitative measures that are times two. So there are multiple scores that they are going to be assigning, but they are not all equal. Um, it's great to have a clear proposal. We love that. Uh, it really seeps into the rest of these scores. However, it is not the most important part of the proposal. The plan is the most important part. The impact is also the most important part. Um, and with continuous improvement grants, obviously we do not have student savings impact here because this is more about improving stuff that is already uh, saving students money. So the organization planning and feasibility is the times three, the teaching and learning impact is times two, and again, clarity and alignment uh, times one. So it is 2.54. I do not want to keep you over, so I'm just going to open this up for questions for the rest of the time. I am really sorry that the uh, microphones are not working, but you will have to uh, type it into the chat in order to proceed. But I will read out that chat. All right, uh, Kira Davis says, I'm new to my campus. How do we determine our institutional grant officer representative? Is there a directory for the USG? So when it comes to finding out who you need to talk to, um, that's going to be within your institution. So talk to your department head, whoever it is that's running your department, and they should be able to get you in contact with the right people. Um, on the USG itself, on their websites, that's not going to help you nearly as much. There are institutions where um, the position of the particular contact might vary depending on the department you're in. 
So yeah, I would say it starts with your department. Just find out who that financial contact will be. Um, and then from there, you should be able to move on. If you can't find it at all, uh, please get in contact with us and we'll, we'll see how we can uh, uh, find your contacts there. But yeah, this is definitely an institution thing. Thank you. Darlene says, I have a few questions. We'll send you and your associate an email. Sounds great. Thank you. Oh, uh, Dimitri Biznosko uh, says, will you share these slides as usual, I hope? Yes, we will share both the video of this and the slides on each RFP page, uh, right where it lists the um, online interest meeting at the moment, once all of this is uh, uploaded and processed. OK, I will not hold you in uh, meeting stasis. Um, thank you so much for being here, and I really hope that you all uh, apply. Oh, uh, Dr. Duza says, can you remind uh, what other documents are needed to submit along with the final grant report? So the final report depends on whether or not your continuous improvement grant or transformation grant. Uh, with your transformation grant, you'll submit your final report document. Uh, you'll also submit any uh, data files that will supplement the description of what you found. Um, and you should be also sending um, an invoice with that, but it depends on your institution. Uh, sometimes institutions do not send invoices until the final report's already submitted. That's up to them. That's totally fine. And the last thing that we absolutely need is either a syllabus or course schedule that defines how you use these resources to teach the course. Uh, so a course schedule with links to the documents that you're using uh, would be extremely helpful. Uh, you know, if you just say we're using an OpenStax textbook, well, OK. But if you're using chapter three of it and then chapter five of it, a uh, link to the web version of those would really help other instructors who would love to repeat um, your success in that classroom uh, on their end, uh, anything to help them out there. So really, the, the big things we're looking for that are absolutely required are the final report and the syllabus. Uh, past that point, if you have additional data files, you can send those. Um, if you have your invoice, you can send that. You can also send a photo of the team or a student if we're uh, if we could use that for promotional purposes later on, you know, putting a face to the successful teams instead of just numbers is, is really nice, but that is optional, especially when so many of us are uh, either hybrid online or sometimes completely uh, online. But with continuous improvement, obviously you do not need supporting data files. We are not looking for your syllabus. That is the final report and the materials you've created. Oh, thank you. All right, thank you all for being here. I'm going to stop the recording now. I will be providing this on the site very soon. <laughs>